everybody. Thank you so much for coming in today. I know that the post-lunch slot can be a bit hard to make sometimes. Um, I'm Chelsea, and today I'm going to be talking about how to break up massive tables through partitioning. Before I start, a bit about myself. I currently work at a fintech company called Brex, based in the US. We started out as the credit card for startups, and now we also do expense management software, et cetera. Previous to this, I was a data engineer, backend engineer, basically making my way down towards infrastructure. Currently, I'm the tech lead of the data storage team, working on Postgres infrastructure, query optimization, and other fun things like that. In this talk today, my goal is to reach point number four, how to partition an existing table, the methodology and trade-offs of how you can do that when you may start from an existing data set. Uh, a topic that was actually discussed if, um, earlier today during the panel if you managed to make it. But in order to get there, I need to kind of take a trip down through a few different topics, starting with what actually is partitioning? What does Postgres provide to you or not provide? Um, what sort of ways can you partition in and what are the pros and cons? As well as when should you partition and when should you maybe not actually partition? Uh, finally, that'll let us get to point four, where I'm going to go through four pretty separate migration methods, four examples, four use cases, each of them getting increasingly a little more insane as the requirements may get more and more stringent, what downtime you can take, what disk space you have it's available to you, etc. Finally, we're going to wrap it up with a discussion of maintenance, configuration, all that good stuff. Without further ado, what is partitioning? Partitioning is the act of splitting one large logical table into n smaller physical tables. In this example here, we can see we have a logical table called students. And in the left um, unpartitioned table, one logical table maps to one physical table space. However, in a partitioned version of the same table, we still have students, but it's the parent table to n partition tables under the hood. So in both these examples, we're able to run the following query select some data from students where ID equals blah. However, in the right partitioned version, when it, hits the, when it hits the students table, instead of finding data locally on the table, uh, it actually routes it to one or more of the tables kind of underneath as child tables. If you were at Claire's talk earlier today, you may have heard some bit about partitioning versus sharding. And um, just to point a quick clarification between the two, Sharding is an optimization of hardware versus partitioning is an optimization of software. So sharding is when you split one data set across multiple nodes. So in this example, if I had three servers, roughly one third of the data per server, that allows me to have three times the amount of CPU, RAM, et cetera. And um, whereas as partitioning is instead splitting the data set across multiple tables all on the same server. So this takes away some of the maintenance headaches that comes with large tables, but I'm not actually increasing any physical availability of resources to my data set. Partitioning in Postgres was made available natively in PG10, but previous to that even, people kind of DIY'd the process via table inheritance. So people would do manual creation of child tables, use triggers to know where to put inserts, Overall, my evaluation on the right is difficult setup, bad performance, don't recommend, hard time. Uh, Postgres 10 entered declarative partitioning. So whenever I mention partitioning from here on out, I'm always talking 10 plus. With the native support of partition tables, you're able to say create table partition by this method. It also allows you to do tuple routing, so it could natively understand which of the child tables you should actually be inserting to and also allowed you to do pruning for selects, which is basically an optimization where a select query can um, dynamically choose how many partitions it actually query. At this point, we had some basic syntax and features, but it wasn't until PG11 that it became a bit more solid, more broadly usable. PG11 brought default partition, hash type, update tuple routing, partition-wise join, and more. Since then, there have been partitioning improvements in basically every major version of Postgres, as far as I'm concerned. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and those features include attaching and detaching partitions concurrently, partition pruning improvements, logical replication for partition tables, uh, and reduced locking in various scenarios. At this point, I would say personally that I consider partitioning a mature first-class Postgres feature with room to grow still. 
Now that we've gone over what Postgres provides to you, let's understand a bit more about the methods with which Postgres allows us to partition. Postgres has three native partition types, range, list, and hash. Each of these has a different type of partition key. A partition key defines how data is subdivided onto partition tables. Because partitioning fundamentally breaks up one logical table into multiple physical tables, Postgres needs a reliable way to understand where an individual tuple should be inserted or where it should be selected from, now that it's not just one table. Range partitioning um, is, my, in my opinion, the most common and often the most useful method of partitioning. In a range partition, partitions include values with a defined min and max. So good examples of what you might use range partitioning for it could be time range data, especially if you're often querying the more recent data, a dashboard of events, maybe preloading in chronological order, some IoT data perhaps, or something like that. If I were gonna create a range partition table, it might look like this. I could create a range partition students table, and I'm gonna partition by inserted at, which you'll notice is a required column on the table. If I just inserted some, if I ran just the first line and then inserted some data, it would actually fail. The reason for this is that at that point, I've only created a parent, a parent table. I've not actually created any partition tables underneath. You still need to very explicitly create those tables in order to be able to insert. So now I'm gonna create two partitions, one from, um, one looks like they're monthly sized time range partitions. And at this point, I'm able to insert values with inserted at values in those two months but if I insert any with any other date, it'll still error. List partitioning is when, you is when you declare based on the explicit column option. So range said between this and this, and list says the value for this column is exactly this value, and I'm gonna declare it ahead of time. Usually list partitioning is a good option when you have low cardinality in a certain column. You don't have to change it that often because usually if you have a list partition table, Adding a new partition means a new migration, so doing that dynamically or doing that all the time can become a burden. A good example might be data separated by user region. So imagine our students table, we have students in the EU, APAC, et cetera. We wanna separate them by region. It's also a great candidate for one of partitioning's excellent features, which I'll talk a bit more later on, which is bulk load and deletion via attach and detach because this allows you to bulk, um, bulk perform actions without running into some MVCC constraints that can lead to bloat, locking, bad performance. All excellent features of that. Um, with police partitioning, you often get skewed partition table size because you know there may be more students in APAC compared to EU. It's all application size, but that's to be expected and often part of what you accept with list partitioning. If I wanted to list partition the students table, you can see now instead of chosen partition by list of grad year, and grad year here is a required integer. In this case, same as before with range, I need to first create some partitions. I'm creating two partitions, but this time at the bottom, you'll see I'm actually creating a default partition as well. Default partition is supported in list and range types, and it basically just says that if there's no explicit partition for this current data, throw it here instead. There's some anti-patterns to that as well, which I'll discuss, but this is helpful because imagine that I didn't get around to making a migration, um, Atlantis pops up, and I suddenly want to add a new list partition for some new continent or area of students. I don't want to throw this error back to the user, potentially. I want to be able to fix it on my own time. So a default partition can prevent, er from, can prevent users from experiencing errors in those scenarios. Hash, part hash partitioning is when you is when you partition based on the hashed value of a column or columns, which define a modulus and a remainder. This is usually used basically when you need to partition, but you just can't find a clear partition key. Um, partitioning is maybe necessary in this case for maintenance and health of the database, but there's not a, cl there's not a clear, really consistent read pattern that you can service. Um, it just needs to happen maintenance-wise. Um, it does distribute very evenly because it's hashed, um, and if I were going to create a hash partition student table, it would be like this. Same table as before, this time partitioned by a hash of ID in this case, um, and which is the primary key. And now I'm going to add three partitions. One way that hash differs from range and list is because in a hash in a hash partition table, you have to decide how many partitions you have at creable at table creation time. List and range, you know, 
You might be able to add ones later on. Oh, I decided I'm onboarding these new students. But the second you create the first partition, you define that modulus, with, in this case, with three. So then I've locked in at this point that I can only have three partitions. And if I ever want to change that, I would have to actually re-migrate to an entirely new version of the table, because if I tried to add a fourth, it would break the hashing function that Postgres is using to route to various child tables. Next up, we're going to discuss why partition, or maybe not partition, because that's always a good answer, too, in my opinion. Smaller partition tables have two levels of impact. There's direct guaranteed impact, and then there's indirect probable impact down the line of that impact, uh, down the line of that, um, that help. So for example, some things that you're guaranteed to get from partitioning include faster parallelizable auto vacuum, um, faster parallelizable index maintenance, builds, re-indexes, et cetera. In range, you can get some level of bucketed natural page ordering. Um, and also, as I said before, you get easy and safe bulk data deletion versus attach and detach. These are all, you know, check the box, guaranteed going to happen. Down the line, as an effect of these benefits, you may see things like query performance improvement, bloat reduction, and better cache efficiency. Digging into why these effects may happen can look something like this. So you get faster parallelizable auto vacuum. Why might that happen? Well, Postgres sees partition tables as just the same as any other table. It's kind of you as a, it's almost like a user experience thing. You as a user see students, but Postgres just sees tables. So all it sees is, oh, now I have smaller tables and that can run auto vacuum more efficiently, and that means that I can parallelize across them vacuuming whenever I need to. This can lead to more recent X-min horizon, which can lead to less bloat over time, vacuum's able to keep up, which can improve your query performance because you have reduced IO on scans. Similarly, a running vacuum more frequently can help keep your visibility map up to date, which helps you perform fewer heap fetches during scans. So those can both help your performance. Similarly, you also get faster and parallelizable index maintenance, so create index, um, re-index, et cetera. This helps you have building and rebuilding lower impact. You know, it's always a bad sign and a good sign that it's maybe time to partition if you start really dreading adding, adding indexes. If you get that feeling, that's kind of a sign to yourself. Um, also, um, having indexes run more quickly or rebuild more quickly helps you keep your X-min horizon more recent because creating indexes concurrently holds X-min horizon as well. Also, with range specifically, you kind of get some convenient natural page ordering. Pages are not ordered naturally via any logic in Postgres. They just find a page and they insert it where they can quite opportunistically. However, if you are kind of, you can kind of consider um, an individual partition table as like a bucket in a range between X and Y. So you know that they'll be roughly ordered in that uh, X and Y range, which can actually help with um, some cache efficiency and making sure that your shared buffers is um, fresh, therefore leading potentially to good query performance. Finally, safe bulk um, attaching and detaching. So MVCC is our friend. You know, we all love it or sometimes love to hate it, but it can make bulk inserts very, um, very impactful on your database. So if you're instead able to bulk attach or detach data, you're able to do that without table bloat, reducing your resource usage. It also can lead to smaller and in the world of cloud, often cheaper disk, um, which are all major benefits to partitioning that you might experience down the line. Now, maybe you're thinking the opposite. Partitioning, I'm on the train, I wanna partition everything. Look at these benefits. Unfortunately, we're not there yet, maybe Postgres someday. Um, there are also downsides. So partitioning can have a possible negative impact on performance. Bad performance on queries might be seen when you don't have a partition key. Because when you decide to partition a given way, unless it's hash or even with hash, still, you're kind of making a statement about how this, this table will be queried. And you're choosing to um, optimize based on that. If you, are, if you have many partitions and you're always querying all the partitions at once, you're actually potentially seeing a, de a degradation of performance. Also, with um, when you have many, many partitions, talking about multiple thousands, not like a couple dozen on a single table, you can also see an increased query planning time. 
This is less true on modern versions of Postgres, but it's still something to call out, especially if you're, I believe it's 13 and below, I believe. Um, also, stronger Postgres knowledge is now required from your app developers, and maybe even migrations, too, to support it. Suddenly, they have to understand the impact of writing their queries. They might say, oh, I introduced this new query. I can't believe it's so slow. I indexed it, when they don't realize that introducing this query is actually sc scanning over um, end partitions, and maybe you don't have enough CPU to support a lot of concurrency in those scans. So Postgres is becoming less of a generic, all-purpose tool from their side. And on the other half of that, it also requires more from you as a DBA or this person setting this up. Suddenly, this partitioning ecosystem requires some more bespoke knowledge, and you have to instrument in more advanced observability, be aware of some gotchas along the way, extensions that you may need to use, et cetera. When is partitioning worth it? Um, an industry rule of thumb you'll see is that you should consider partitioning a table when it reaches over 100 gigs. This is a consider point. It doesn't mean you need to. It doesn't mean that there are no situations where you should partition smaller than that. But I personally don't think I've run into any where it was necessary under 100 gigs. Because like I said, it's first and foremost in a maintenance optimization with downstream effects in other ways. The, the, the Postgres docs also specify that they suggest it when table size is larger than the physical memory of the server. But I have personally mostly relied on the first rule of thumb, to be honest. In my far less official rules of thumb, some things that I think about when I'm trying to decide to partition or not, for range, I think, well, range for me is often the best return on value. If your table has a natural range partition key, and especially if you want to expire or delete old data, if you can choose to archive it maybe to cold storage, or if you just don't care about keeping it, maybe in an IoT scenario, range is a really excellent choice. And even though it doesn't seem to like help out from a performance perspective, I've actually seen the best performance improvements personally on range. With list, it's not something I personally have a ton of experience in, honestly, but if you need to do a lot of deleting and inserting in bulk, um, this is a really excellent choice here. I would say list should really be considered if you know you're not gonna be increasing the cardinality of the options of your, um, of your partitioned key that often. And if you're gonna do something like, like a regular bulk increase or attach, this is extremely helpful. Hash partitioning, it's really just, you really need to do it for maintenance reasons. Auto vacuum index creation is having a lot of overhead. This is um, a good opportunity to do hash partitioning. Um, there should be no plans to attach or detach partition because I don't even, honestly, I don't even know if you can do it on that because it has no functionality. Um, there'd be no logical way to choose what you needed to remove because of course, all the values are hashed and randomly placed into a, into a certain partition table. So there's not gonna be a lot of utility for that. You shouldn't expect to do like easy deletes or inserts. You may have noticed there was a little something I kind of whispered in, which was this like gotchas, but they do exist. The big gotcha, in my opinion, is that table primary keys and unique constraints must include the partition key. So. If I had a PK that was not included in the, in the partition key, then I would get this error. Insufficient columns and primary key constraint because basically maybe I have my PK on ID, but I'm trying to range partition by inserted at. You may have seen actually in my example, I was a little bit sneaky because in my range partitioning example, I had an ID that was big int, but it wasn't a primary key. The actual primary key was a composite primary key of ID and inserted at. Having the inserted at in the primary key allows me to then partition by range. However, this is not exactly foolproof. Um, this is now a migration and a change that your developers will have to go through. And this also changes the actual constraints, of course. You're literally changing a constraint. And if you have a composite P primary key now between ID and inserted at, ID is no longer individually unique, so you may need to rely on application side like UUID generation or something that can be relied upon to make sure it's still unique. You also will need to be aware of upserts because those need to provide all primary key fields in order to target a given row. Some more rapid fire gotchas include range and list partitioning with defaults. As I said, default partition, feature or a bug, depends. I think it's a feature because it stops errors from showing to your user, which is just something that you realistically need. However, 
it's sometimes I've seen the scenario where there's no observability or people aren't really checking out the table. They forget to add a new list or range partition and they say, why is this so slow? And they go by and their default partition has like 50, 100, hundreds of gigabytes of disk in it, which is essentially reducing the entire point of partitioning. With hash, with hash partitioning, you need to be aware of range queries, such as where partition key between X and Y, like insert that between this day and this day. That actually can't use partition pruning. So even if you have a 1,000 partitions, it will need to query over all of them because it won't be able to logically tell where the range begins or ends. Also, like I said before, partition count can't be changed without completely remigrating and repartitioning. Finally, I'm going to point out logical replication and CDC. So before Postgres 13, logical replication was not supported for partition tables. Now, since 13, if you declare a publication, you can say publish via partition root. And that root, and that allows you to choose whether you want to publish your table as a, as a single table, so students is just called students to the, um, to the subscriber, or if you want to partition every table by name. So students would actually be called what it Postgres sees as under the hood. So, you know, partition one, two, three. Now that we have some gotchas, and those will come up in the last section, now we're onto the section of actually partitioning an existing table. How do I go about that? Why is it actually a challenge to partition a table? It seems like the kind of thing you would only run into once you have enough data to make this relevant. That is true, but unfortunately right now, declarative partitioning doesn't support alter table partition by concurrently. Shout out to any committers in the room, very much want that. Um, and if so, you never have to listen to this presentation. So, you know, all the best. So, um, and this migration needs to be performed manually. And there's a lot of different levels of doing this migration depending on what your actual constraints are. So, typically, they need to be, mig they need to be migrated. And this can involve DBA only work, it can involve DBA and app developer work. It really depends. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about four example ways. The first is going to be a purely offline migration. Just get it done right now. We don't care that much about how much we go offline. The last three are all going to be varying levels of online, meaning your user has a varying level of availability during this time. The first is going to be when you have extra disk space, you're duplicating some disk. The second is going to be no duplicated disk space. And the third is going to be using logical replication. I mean, fourth is going to be logical replication. As a disclaimer, there are many, many, many ways to do this. In this talk, I wanted to make it relatively technology agnostic, or extension agnostic especially. So the examples are going to focus on native Postgres methods, which I've used, rather than diving into specifics of any given extension. If you're interested in learning more about extensions, you can check out ones such as PG Partman, PG Slice, and PG Party, all of which provide some level of either migration utility or automatic um, partition setup. I'll mention them a little bit during the talk, but primarily this is going to be native Postgres. In the case of number one, I'm going to keep our students example going. So we have our students table, and at the start of every new year, admins need to insert about half a million students for the new grad year and delete about half a million of newly graduated students. The table we're going to say is about 100 gigabytes in space, and it's serving some live traffic during student, while students are in school. It's about mostly reads, though. It's pretty much a read-only application, maybe 10% insert, update, delete, merge. And traffic is concentrated 9 to 5 because it's for schools. And also, they really don't want to spend a lot on engineering on this. You know, they're too busy paying their teachers super well. They don't care about that DBA budget. Our constraints here are going to be really broad. So we're OK. Because we have that 9 to 5, we're actually fine with a couple hours of downtime. We have a lot of disk space available. And our desired schema is going to be list partitioning by graduation year because when you see that, you know, adding, deleting, we may that we can map that in our heads to we want to be able to attach and detach partitions. When I start out, the first thing you're going to do is create a new duplicate table. So my main one is called students, and for the rest of the examples, I'll be using SV2. It has the same schema, except for you can see it's partitioned by list of grad year. The next thing I'm going to do is create any and all partitions I need, including the default if you want to, though it's not listed here. And then you're going to create indexes. Make sure that you actually index all the same indexes you need. In this case, you can see a point of the index creation non-concurrently, because nothing's hitting this, so it doesn't matter. 
And also, it's on the parent table. When you create an index on the parent table, it'll create all the indexes below. So that's kind of a nice little way you can do that. Now, I'm going to manually insert the data through your preferred means. I knew I wasn't going to talk about extensions, but I will call out some because in this case, I'm just doing the most basic la one large insert unbatched scenario you could do because I'm just taking full downtime. But I will say that PG Partman has some functionality that allows you to kind of batch inserts natively, so that's a good thing to consider there. Um, but if I'm doing it Postgres native, simplistic, I'll begin a transaction. I'll just insert into the new table, select star from old table. Within the same transaction, I'm now going to swap the two tables. So still in the same transaction, I'm going to alter the unpartitioned students table to be called anything else, doesn't really matter. In this case, students archived. And then I'm going to alter SV2 to rename it to students and commit the transaction. Now that I'm back online, because during this transaction, we were holding an access exclusive lock, so you know, our applications were offline, um, the applications will connect, and they'll hit the students table. They won't know that it's partitioned, even though it is now. All they care is they can read from students, and it has the schema they expect. Now that I'm back online, maybe I want to wait a little bit to do some validation. I can see that I can now drop the table students archived because I'm no longer inserting to it. There's no real utility to keeping it around, which will free up the disk. In our second example, we're now going to do a slightly more online migration with duplicated tables. Now our school district is running into issues with database maintenance time. Um, it's gotten up to, the table's gone up to about 300 gigabytes, and they're having problems keeping vacuum up, um, re-indexing and creating new indexes, maybe even you know, doing other migrations. It's taking quite a long time. And they're also expecting to see a, a 2x data growth this year since they're merging some districts. We also see, though, that the read versus write ratio is a little different here. It's like only 60% reads, a little bit more writes, upserts, et cetera, than we saw before. And also, traffic is now evenly distributed throughout the day. In these constraints, they're hoping to have three or few minutes downtime acceptable, but they have a lot of extra disk space. We can see they have 600 gigs of disk, which is twice the size of our current table size. So we know we can duplicate rows safely. Their desired schema is partitioning by hash because they don't have a lot of consistency in their read queries, and they, all, they don't foresee any deletions or bulk additions, and they mostly just need it for maintenance purposes. The first thing I'm going to do, similar to before but not quite, is I'm going to create SV2. This time, I can use a little bit of syntactic sugar, and I can see create SV2 like students, including defaults, indexes, constraints, which means you don't have to manually recreate the indexes, which is kind of convenient. And then I can partition by hash ID. At this point, the same as before, I need to make sure I add all the partitions I need, deciding on modulus 10 right now. So I'm going to make 10 separate partitions at this point. At this point, I'm going to run into some PLPG SQL. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create or replace this function, duplicate, to partition table. It's a little long to include here, so there's a bit.ly link in case you want to check it out as a gist. But basically, what this does is it makes sure that any time you insert, update, or delete on the students table, it's duplicating that appropriately to the what I'm going to call the shadow table or the duplicate table. Then I'm going to create the trigger using that function after insert, update, delete on students. I'll point out that, as far as I can tell on the documentation, it doesn't support merge. So if you do have merges, you may need to check that out manually. Um, but once I have this and once I've attached it, I can be sure that any from here on out, whenever this starts, whenever I create the trigger, any new updates or any data updated will be included on the table. Now that I have all the fresh data coming in, anything you add, I can run a historical backfill for that data from students inserting into the shadow table in batches. When I find primary key conflicts, you should do nothing, because that means that sometime in your select, that row was updated, um, that was, row was updated by the trigger, so you want to give the trigger priority over your query. Once I've updated, it's good to do a little validation, you know, just do a little spot check, make sure you see what you expect to see. Um, you can expect to see disk size be smaller on the second table, purely because you're creating it fresh with no table bloat whatsoever. So that shouldn't be something that concerns you. But once you're ready to switch over, you can, again, just as before, create transaction, swap table names, commit. Once that's done, just as before, you're free to drop the table students archived, and you're now serving a partition table to your users. The third example is going to be essentially duplicate with one 
essentially duplicate to number two, but with one pretty significant constraint change. So in this case, previously, we had a lot of disk space available. We had enough space to duplicate all the rows in our, in our um, table. But in this case, we have a 300 gigabyte table that only has 100 gigabytes of disk available left on the server. We still want to partition by hash, everything else the same. What can we do in this case? In this case, we're going to start out exactly the same. This is exactly the same as before. We're starting out creating the new SV2 table, creating the partitions. It's all empty. But now we're going to create a new trigger. So this trigger is a little bit different. Instead, we're going to create one that on insert, inserts only to the new table. On delete, deletes from both. And on update, deletes from the old table and inserts or updates on the new one. This is a little much to process, and I'm going to give a shout out to Andrew Dunstan at Second Quadrant, part of EDB, which is where I kind of heard about this in a blog post, which I very much appreciated. And, um, but if you create this insert, which you're, if you create this, um, if you create this trigger or this function, once you start, once you actually um, want to use it, it's going to look like this. So unlike before, we're not going to actually start using the trigger right away. Instead, we're going to replace the student's table actually with a view, not with another table. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start a transaction. You're going to alter the table to rename to whatever. Again, in this case, students archived. Now we're going to create a view students that selects everything from the old and the new table, just unions it all together. This means that once we finish this transaction, all the, all the sessions that are going to be connecting to this will think they're looking at a table, but really they're looking at a combined view of your partition table and your non-partition table. This isn't a great thing to end on. You should definitely get out of this state, but it is functional for making this transition. Once you've done that, in the same transaction still, you want to create the trigger and attach it as expected. Now, for each row, you want to execute that, which will make sure that, again, for all your live data following this, you're going to be able to be served to users and also copy over. Now you need to run your backfill again. I didn't include any code for this one, because my personal preference actually is to do an application side backfill or a script backfill in Python or Golang or whatever happens to be helpful. It is possible to do it Postgres natively, of course, but that's what I find easiest. There is a Postgres native example, I believe, in the blog link. When you're all caught up, do some spot checking again just to make sure that your logic from the logic from the trigger and anything else is correct. And then in a single transaction, you can drop the view students, you can drop the function, and then you can alter the table to rename to students. When you go back online, just as before, your applications will be looking at the students partition table. When you finish, you can also just drop the archive, archive table as well. Now we're on to the most, I think, fun, but also a bit craziest in, um, version with the most steps. So for reasons I can't actually make a great example use case for, but I guess is the case, there's a lot of students. It's about 1.2 terabytes. The district also expects to regularly partition more tables. This is going to be something they have to repeat a lot over time. So they want the process to be quite dynamic and repeatable. Also, the applications connect to PG Bouncer. We're at a higher scale. They're using PG Bouncer. So they're not connecting directly to the host. They're connecting to a student's PG Bouncer DNS. So at this point, we're serving live traffic, about 80% reads and 20% inserts, updates, deletes. And the traffic is evenly distributed throughout the day. We also want to take very little downtime, don't have enough disk space available to duplicate, and the task must be reasonably redone. We want, to, we want to be able to partition by range on inserted at in this case. The TLDR, which I'll go over more in a sort of graphic in the next slide, is that first we're going to ensure that the source table has a primary key and does not use sequences, which would make it unable to use logical replication. Then we're going to set up a whole new instance. We're talking a new server here. We're not on the same server anymore. And we're going to create the desired partition schema and database roles there. We're going to create a publication for the tables on the source database and make sure it's done with publication via partition root is true, as I said before. Next thing we're going to do is back on the destination, create a subscription. When you do that, it'll automatically create a replication slot, and it'll start catching up all the data. This is nice because with logical replication, you don't have to do a backfill. It will do historical and fresh data, so there's no backfill necessary. You need to make sure that while it's catching up, there's no DDL migrations that go on, because those also will mess things up for you. 
At that point, you're caught up and you can migrate any replica or explicitly read-only transactions from the source to the destination. This is a great time to do some spot checking. At this point, your destination database is essentially a replica with like a bit more lag because it's gonna be a bit slower to get logical replication. Once you're validated there, you can put your writes offline, which means you cut off writes from the primary, scaling down to zero or however you wanna cut writes to the primary only. You can check your replication slot lag in LSN to make sure all the data is transferred. Maybe do a quick spot check as well. Then you can reconfigure PG Bouncer to just point instead at the new destination database. Scale back up, and you're no longer pointing any writes or reads to the original database. You're now pointing them all to your destination server with the new partition table. If you want to see a visual what this looks like, you could have application backends pointed at the PG Bouncer. And again, it's sending reads and writes to your single node that has the unpartitioned table. I'm gonna set up a new node, and I'm gonna create the version of the schema there that has a partitioned table. At this point, it's empty. I'm gonna create the publication and then the subscription, and the replication slot will start carrying over all the historical data, and then it'll start updating the fresh data, keeping it updated as it continues. Now I can switch over the reads. If I see any issues, of course, you're gonna go back, but it's a good point to make sure that your roles are in place, your database users can all log in, um, all these steps are completed as well. When you're ready to start cutover, you need to stop leaving reads on, so it can be read-only is up, potentially. Um, you're gonna stop writes to the initial host. While that's going, you're gonna run a query similar to this, which is basically just gonna check that your LSN is caught up. I, again, also recommend a quick spot check because LSNs are not necessarily monotonically increasing, so it's good to double check as well but um, this is a great query to start at. Once you are caught up, you can switch over your writes to the new server as well. You may have been asking, do you even need to publish to a new instance? Can I like logically replicate from students on the host and maybe just logically replicate it almost pointed at itself to the same server? It seems a lot easier than creating this whole new node and going through all that craziness. So technically, yes, however, Schema, table, and column names need to stay the same on publishers and subscribers. So you can change the partitioning, but the only way that's possible is if you change the database name on the same host, which, in my opinion, isn't super convenient for your applications. And also, essentially, you're getting an instance upgrade for free. So I say take it, personally. Once, you're, once you've now migrated, you have some jobs left to do. You have to make sure it's still in a good place to take care of now that you have either a new host or just a new database with a partition table. The first thing you'll need to worry about is maintenance. So I mentioned before, um, you really don't want to run into the case where you don't have a partition available for inserted data. So I recommend PG Partman for regular creation of new partitions. You can use it with cron or something different, or I believe there's a scheduler but I personally have just used cron. Um, it's an extension which can help you create and manage time-based and number-based partition sets. Uh, it can also help you regularly detach old data if you need that as well. Um, and here's an example of a maintenance function you'd be able to run with that. With observability, you need to make sure that you change your, your necessary observability for a partition table from the default. Partitions are going to be created or deleted by PG Partman, for example. You should make sure that that's always successful. You should also make sure you alert based on lack of data, not just success. So if for some reason your cron fails silently, you're not left in the dark. I also recommend um, alerting or having monitoring on partition size skew, especially for list partitions. If you're feeling fancy, you can even do something like run a regular query on the default partition and send a low-level alert if there's ever you know, more than zero rows or something like that. Because maybe that sends a notification that you should go check it out. Maybe you're missing a partition. I also recommend, I mean, this is always kind of a good recommendation, but I recommend that you set up auto-explain. Because again, with, um, with, with partitioning, you're now expecting your app developers kind of understand the right and wrong way to query a table, how it's gonna be performance and non-performance. Setting up auto-explain will automatically log your explain analyze plans for slow queries above a certain threshold. So if you do that, they'll be able to actually see and have some discoverability themselves for why something might be slow. For configuration, 
There's not a ton that needs to change, but any configs that need to change are basically just a function of table count growing, not it being partitioning specifically. So you may want to change auto vacuum max workers in the case that you have many thousands of partitions. By default, this is three. However, you may want to consider increasing based on your resource usage. If you check and you see that there's always three auto vacuum workers running, you may want to just tick that up one, wait, see how it reacts, and make sure that it's functional. Because of course, you're taking that available worker from application-facing queries, but it could be worth it if you have many thousands of partitions and tables. Finally, organizational support. Building an understanding of partitioning and its benefits and constraints across your engineering organization can be very important. So creating things such as internal or even open source blog posts, um, something that I did that has worked really well in my organization is, is I set up a GitHub webhook. So anytime anybody opens a new migration, we automatically link our migration and partitioning guides to their PR in a comment. Or something like that, which auto-documents the process as you go along. Um, if you're stuck, maybe try considering asking some questions to yourself or your org. How can your partition tables stay performance and well understood going forward? And how can you enable engineers to write partitioning aware queries? And with that, that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, one detail that got me really concerned was about the sequences. Mm. Uh, we're running rather old uh, Postgres. One of our production systems is in 10, but we never faced any problem with uh, logical partitioning in sequences unless we use the, uh, you know, the, the subscriber as a writing database as well. Mm. So I, don't, I didn't understand that, why sequence could be a problem. Um, this is an area where, I'm going to be honest, I don't have a ton of experience because my current and last organizations both use application-generated sequences. But um, my understanding is logical replication does not, is not able to copy over sequences um, dynamically. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? I'd be yeah, happy but, to hear but, from by the, the But the insert will, um, will get executed just fine. Hmm. Uh, the, the sequence might not, you know, advance on the, uh, of the subscriber, but... The, the insert will, will work. Uh, I think it's, it's not, I, I, I don't want to answer this any further because I'm not 100% sure. I'm going to maybe leave it for discussion afterwards. But I believe in the case that you're switching over your rights to actually be your destination, not being able to create sequences would be a major problem. But I would rather maybe leave that for a different question. Also, also I think um, yeah. there's, uh, switching is the key word here. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so you don't keep it running after you have already partitioned the tables. Yeah. Yeah. And a logical replication example, you're actually switching your host. It's not yes. staying as a replica. You're not just reading from it or using it as a downstream, like in Snowflake or Redshift or something, OLAP. You're actually going to switch to write to it down there. Um, in the front or over there, either way. Yes. So you can have. A List range and hash as partitioning. Can this add some overhead? Because we have to now make a calculation of where we're going to go, or are the benefits just making it negligible? Um, the question. So, so the question is, if there's any overhead to adding partition, like, is that for in an, in an insert, how do you decide which partition to go to? So technically, yes, but in experience, for me, no. Um, so on technicality, like anything you add to the query planner's job is going to add a little bit of latency. But personally, I haven't run into any issues with that. Um, I believe that, I think I said in earlier versions of Postgres, if you get to many, many partitions, like a couple thousand, that would add query planning time. But I think they've since basically fixed that in more modern versions of Postgres. Yeah? yeah. Uh, maybe a small bug in one of your earlier slides. Um, the range specification on a partition is a half open interval. And I think your slide assumed it was a closed inter an open interval. Uh, sorry, can you, you said in the slide, I said something that was different than the, what was on the slide? No, um, on the slide, it gave a uh, time range example. Mm. And the two part of that range was always some hour colon 59, colon uh, 59. Yeah. And that should just be the next whole hour. 
Ah, thank you. <laughs> I'll make sure to correct that. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much.